Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, for the session and Emanuela for inviting uh, for inviting me to come. Um, what I want to do is give you an overview of our site and basically uh, give you some of the highlights of, uh, of our 13 years of excavation, including um, some of our new discoveries that we made just a few weeks ago. Uh, the overview of the site, just so that you know where we are located, we're in the western side of Cilicia. Um, in the Ghazi Pasha Basin, um, just on the southern fringe of the Ghazi Pasha Basin, um, where it is quite mountainous. It was um, um, rough Cilicia or, or Cilicia trachea uh, in antiquity. In the um, period before the site was founded, um, it was involved with the uh, with piracy, the famed Silician pirates who, uh, and here's just a, a view of the site um, as it's undergoing excavation now. The area was a haven, this coastline along the coast of, uh, of Anatolia here was a haven for pirates in the late Hellenistic period who use the secluded areas, the, the secluded anchorages um, off the coast as, a, as uh, places to anchor their ships as they waited for passing sea traffic where they would then, uh, where they would get, then capture and skedaddle into the redoubts up in the hills um, I found some Silician pirates when I'm looking for them online. I even found a video game involving the Silician pirates, uh, which I found quite intriguing. But we also have these caves uh, near Salinas, as this one, that um, we found um, anchorages where ships could be moored. And I don't want to say that that definitely represents a, a pirate uh, a, a pirate cave, but it may certainly have ser served as such uh, because these pirates were located throughout the, uh, the, the coastline here. Uh, Antiochia ad Kragum, we know from our historical sources, was one of these pirate bases, and that was, in fact, the reason that drew us here back in the mid-1990s as part of a survey project to see if we can, in part, find um, evidence of the, uh, of the Silician pirates. Uh, in a 10-year-long survey, in not just survey, looking for pirates, but we also did a, uh, a, a region, uh, a, a large region survey uh, in which we documented the archaeological sites. And after that survey was over in the mid-90s, uh, sorry, in the mid-2000s, then we decided to transition into excavation. And for a variety of reasons, we chose Antiochia ad Kragum as the, uh, as the place that we thought would best answer a new set of questions that we had formulated. Uh, we were interested in the... Uh, in underwater um, surveying of the harbor, as we see here from an aerial view. Uh, this is just taken last month uh, by my colleague and myself, as Professor Townsend uh, there in, in front. Uh, but we have conducted three surveys of the harbor uh, where we have documented various anchors that, uh, the one on the left dating back to the Neolithic period, one on the right, a Roman anchor. Um, so we are able to show some uh, forms of habitation or interest in the site from prehistory through, uh, through the Roman period and into even the Middle Ages. Uh, in 2004, uh, one of our underwater survey uh, surveys uncovered a, uh, a, a bow, uh, a bronze ship uh, timber fitting that was in the form of a uh, of the of the mythological figure Pegasus. 
a fragment of wood still preserved inside the socket was carbon dated and it came to uh, approximately 120 BC, right smack in the middle of the pirate period. Um, so we do have a smoking gun of potential pirate uh, occupation usage within the, within the harbor. It's now on display in the Alanya Museum. Um, the city itself would be founded about 100 years after the, the pirate um, problem was quelled by Pompey the Great in 67. The site would be founded in the middle of the first century AD um, by Antiochus, the king of Comagene, who was a client king under Rome. Um, most of the major buildings that we have, including the Great Bath, whose uh, still well-preserved Frigidarium, uh, we can now date to the end of the first century AD, uh, belongs. Um, we also have a, a temple. Professor Townsend will speak after I am done on the imperial temple. Um, of the site. I just wanted to give you some of the, um, a, a presentation of some of the other remains of the site, uh, including the great bath that we see looming here in front of you. It is a, a large structure that requires a great deal of time and, and energy to clear. Uh, we have now been working on this for uh, six years. Uh, if we only have uh, six weeks to two months each year to work on it, it does take a great deal of time to clear the entire structure. Uh, but we have succeeded in clearing the entire frigidarium that you see here, and we have begun uh, working inside of the tepidarium. One of the interesting aspects of the, of the excavation, not just of this building, but several of the others, is not just to understand the building as it was intended to, as it was intended, such as the bath. It served as a bath for a good 200 years until it fell out of use, but then would be repurposed. And its, its repurposing was that of a, we say in Turkish, a sanai, a light industrial area in this case, the tepidarium, for example, um, we have found evidence of, uh, of ceramic kilns. We have now uh, five kilns that we have found within the bath complex. Two of them are here in this drone view. One of them is so well preserved, you can still see the firing holes um, that uh, allowed the hot gases from the firing chamber to um, to heat inside of the chamber. We know from the remnants of the ceramics that we're finding that many Zemer 41s, late Roman amphoras, were, dis were made in, uh, in this kiln. Um, we also have found very close by the remnants of a, uh, of a glass furnace and a glass workshop. Uh, one of our uh, one of our great finds was just directly next to the bath. This was uh, in 2002, while we were still conducting surveys. Uh, one of our students stumbled uh, on the field next to the bath and saw the remnants of a or saw a, a small fragment, a small patch of mosaic that a local farmer had uncovered. Uh, we, uh, we confronted the farmer and also notified the museum because they had, they were in charge of the archaeology in the area. Uh, and they did a very quick survey and found indeed a mosaic. But when we were given the, the permit for excavation, we began work here and cleared this mosaic. And as you can see, it turned out to be quite a, an extraordinary find. Um, a mosaic that encompassed uh, uh, 36 meters long, uh, 17 meters wide. This is only part of the excavation in one season. We finished its completion in, uh, in this is 2013, uh, with a swimming pool in the middle, complete with steps that 
lead down into the uh, into the the pool so bathers can sit or um, stand upon the step there just enjoy the water it had fresh water flowing in through the drainage system we explored we found over a hundred coins uh, many of those that have been able to be read indicate an early fourth century date a date in the Constantinian period and some gold jewelry as you see here this, so this was an extraordinary uh, extraordinary find that bespeaks the the wealth of the of the site. One of the other areas we were interested in is adjacent to the bath on the other side from the uh, from the mosaic courtyard. Uh, this area that is now covered with uh, bushes we excavated and we discovered the Odeon and Bulletarium, which account for my question too. Um, to um, Professor Sumner about the potential of this serving as a theater also. It's a very small structure, as you can see, um, with seating in a grandstand, uh, in, in a grandstand way in which they would have been on wooden seats supported by these radiating walls with an orchestra. We have yet to clear the, the pulpy tomb. Uh, because that still serves as our staging area for the uh, removal of soil from the site. Um, but last year we found one of the brackets that would have held the wooden planks inside and, uh, and a piece of wood still adhered to the inside of the bracket, which has now been carbon dated to approximately 120 AD. So again, we're looking at a building that is of close date to the early foundations of the, of the city. Uh, this was taken just a, a month and a half, actually, just um, early in August, um, of a latrine that we found in between the Great Bath and the Bulletarium. So it would have served the, for the, the needed function where you have two congregations appearing uh, the we can you can see that it too has a mosaic on its pavement mosaic art is kind of unusual in the sense that it is a kind of a jokeful uh, mosaic is something that would benefit or I suppose might be appropriate for a latrine it is full of bathroom humor it would in which we have a mythological figure, Narcissus, who is shown not admiring himself, but his rather large phallus. Uh, by the way, uh, this is the very first time this has been shown in public. Uh, it hasn't been announced to the press yet, although I don't think this would rise to the level of the New York Times. Uh, we also have Ganymede, um, who is shown in, uh, this time not in encased by Zeus in the form of an eagle, but rather by a heron who, um, and Ganymede is holding on to a stick with a sponge at the end of it, which is quite appropriate for a latrine, while his phallus is being uh, attended to by the heron with his own sponge. So it is rather uh, uh, humorous in a somewhat of a sexual way. Um, we began looking at a small bath located just outside of the main gate of the city this past summer. Uh, this is a view of it at the end of excavation for this, uh, for this past season. We were working primarily on the end. Here we go. Uh, you can see on the, on the hillside slope we have, these are the cold rooms sort of an unusual arrangement, this, uh, this bath. So these are, are cold rooms that then are placed with a large two-aisled, um, 20 meter long um, exercise area, but enclosed exercise area. Whereas on the seaward side, we would have had the warm rooms. Uh, so these are all cold rooms. We began excavating inside of here, also at the end of one of these halls, the bottom of which we found mosaics in, in each one. You can see the 
uh, the geometric mosaic at the bottom of this particular um, of this particular cold room. The exciting thing was that um, this is how it looked on the first day of excavation, approximately um, two and two three quarter meters of fill had to be removed, but only uh, 80 centimeters down, we came across a coin hoard. Um, and not just one hoard, but in fact, there were two hoards of almost entirely silver coins um, with some gold thrown in and only a few bronze. Um, so it was uh, quite, a, uh, quite a, an extraordinary event that we found. Some total, it was over 4,000 silver coins that were discovered, all dating to, we think, a deposit based on the latest coin that we are so far able to read of about 1620. So these are coins of all the major uh, states of Europe, including Spain, um, uh, Venice here, Andrea Gritti, the coin dated to um, just before 1538. We also have Henry IV of France dating to 1600, 1610. Uh, and many other coins you can see that so far we've been able to clean and, and identify. But the latest coins seem to appear to be around 1620. Uh, many more to go. Uh, we'll be working on this sort for some time to come. Uh, but I think it is safe to say that these belong to, um, to a period uh, in the Mediterranean in which piracy was in fact a major uh, player yet again. Um, the possibility in fact of Barbary Coast pirates, even though we're not on the Barbary Coast themselves, but Ottoman, uh, Ottoman pirates and captains were involved in the, uh, in the predations that occurred and it's not therefore out of the realm of possibilities that we have some sort of an association. So uh, we like to think that we came looking for pirates and in fact we wound up perhaps finding uh, some evidence of piracy here at Antiochia at Crockett. Thank you very much. Who knows what we're going to find in succeeding years. Thanks.